I'm speaking as a ex-marketing guy. I also started off at Unilever. I'm sorry, we seem to have permeated the day here. Um, but basically, what, we're, what I'm trying to do is to understand what motivates people, what makes them happy. That's all I care about. We know a lot of things that make us unhappy, some of the things that we're all here to try to solve the problems. We know that's what makes people unhappy. How can we make them happy? How can we get them to do something they want to do but can't do by themselves? That's the role of the fundraiser, to bring the world into an organization that can create things that will solve these problems that are making people unhappy. So whether that's the UNHCR or it's one of the innumerable charities and NGOs that we have here today. This is what I'm trying to do, is to try to move beyond what's happening inside of our organizations, our disciplines, our marketing, our finance, uh, the different languages that we have, marketing, communications, HR. What happens when we as fundraisers start bringing the world into the organization, what happens? The reason I'm here today is Alan asked me. He said, look, would you like to come along and speak at this? And I said, well, it's fundraisers. I don't really, don't, I'm not a fundraiser. It seems kind of phony for me to be here. And he said, well, look, what is, the, what is the thing that stops taking your ideas and creating great programs each time? I said, well, that's easy. As soon as I bring people into the organization, the organization can't deal with it. We, have, we set up all sorts of things. And he says, well, can, can commercial organizations, they seem to make a lot of money. They seem to do it. You work a lot with commercial organizations. Um, can bring some of the lessons in, in, from there into this forum. And I said, well, you wouldn't want to. You know, if, you, if you're working with commercial organizations, they're the most dysfunctional groups of individuals in the world. I said, you know, if we, if we look, we can see our whole society falling apart. Now, is that a few bad apples and a few uh, uh, financial institutions? Or is this, are the financial institutions working with what they're given? What does the world of word, world look like? And <clears throat> for the last 10 years, I've been measuring the world of work, currently working with the manpower in, in Australia and Asia, looking at what is the gene pool of people they've got to put into organizations? What do they look like? And um, one of the things that we found is that when we look at populations around the world, we keep getting the same patterns over and over again. We've been working with business schools and universities looking at a whole range of the way that we can measure people. Now, the way to look at this is to just look where the hot parts are and where the cold parts are. Uh, so it's red and yellow, those are the hot parts. The greens and the blues, those are the cold part. Basically, that's what is telling us that people in work aren't representative of the whole population. The whole population has some red bits and some green bits and some blue bits. So what we're looking for is where the concentration of a particular kind of value comes into it. And this is what we're doing. It's called values research. What motivates people? Now, I'm going to go right back to where we started and if you just take a look up at the top corner there, you'll see things called <clears throat> two classes, unobliged, material wealth, power. Okay? This is a, these are the kind of things that these kind of people value who are in that particular corner. If we look at the bottom here, we see self-direction, benevolence, caring, openness, justice, universalism. These are values that are directly opposite, in fact, antagonistic to people who are looking for power. Now, this is the thing that we have measured in cultures all around the world. There's been over 100 different studies done, academic studies, not our studies, but academic studies, that are pointing out that this, these are the prime poles in any human population. Our job is to say, well, what's going to happen next? We have a model that actually helps us do that, which we don't have time to talk about today, but I, I'm here. You want to see me? We can do that. The basic thing is that there's, there's, three, there's three prime. It's between power and universalism, and it goes down that angle. The, and that is the most powerful axis. The second most powerful axis goes the other way, uh, and that's between conformity and autonomy down here. And the one that goes right across is, is a little bit weaker. And if you could just say, well, that's about me, and that's about we. Now, taking those three different axes, you can begin to look at any issue and say, where do you want to be, and then come to somebody like us and find out where you're, at, you're actually at. So it's very, very simple. There's three different uh, ways of looking at human motivations that can be cut along these axes. So what that basically means is a constant culture war going on. 
As, as populations move away from that green area into that red area and then kind of move down towards the bottom, away from power and towards universalism, what we see is this is a natural movement in human value systems. The first thing is that we want to conform, and then we want to be better, and then we decide that both of those are kind of a waste of time, and we need to move, move on to something else. And that something else is what's driving people in this room. So what we're really looking at is the war between uh, competition and collaboration. Now, when we go in and we look at organizations, this is what they try to tell us. Look, we're all marching in step together. We're like a well-formed army. Look, here's our uniform. Um, and I said, well, is that true? Are you treating your people like a bunch of faceless drones? It's top down. Here's what you need to do. So if you went to business school, if you were saying, look, I want to be, become more professional in what I do, this is what they're going to teach you at business school. We work with business schools. I lecture in business schools to try to say this stuff, if, guys, you've been sold a bill of goods. Basically, what, what uh, corporations are trying to do is create corporate empathy leadership. It used to be, I'm in charge. I'm the big charismatic guy. I'm going to tell you what to do. I'm the general of an army. And they find out that it doesn't actually work. And so what they're trying to do is develop empathy. That's part of our job. That's how I go in there. So what we're doing is actually looking at what's going on inside of people's head. Are they faceless drone? Are they the army? No, actually, it's all about emotions and what do you want to do with the job that you've actually got. And so what, what we're actually working with is what I call corporate fantasy. And in corporate fantasy, this is where people are coming together. We're on a team. We're going to win. We're going to dominate. We're going to... This is the language of business. Is this the language that you actually want? Because this is the kind of thing that seeps through. It's what I call the dominant narrative. This is the way we run our organizations. So we look at here, the corporate fantasy. We're all like Navy SEALs. We go in, we do, we do the thing, we take, the, we, we take everything, and we leave nothing behind. Actually, I've worked with the Navy SEALs twice, and that's not the way they are at all. They look more like you. Okay, so the, the, the corporate narrative and the corporate fantasy may not actually be the same thing. But when we go out and say, look, we're going to win, we're going to win together as a team, we're going to be Navy SEALs, and we're going to go out and bond, well, this is actually what we end up with. With a bunch of guys running around playing at being mighty warriors, but this is the thing that then comes back into your organization, that, the, oh, we're bonded as a team, and we're going to win. These are probably some of the things that will be peddled to the people that you're going to be talking to. You're bringing in reality, and this is their reality. So the thing that we have to do is not that, that, that we'll go out to corporates and we'll play the corporate game. We heard about how corporates are trying to do better things. What we can do is help them become more like us. But there's a real problem here. Because once we get into our organization, we also hear from the UNH. Uh, HCR, that it's actually very conservative and it slows down. In our purposes, it's not that it's conservative, it's that everybody's trying to be very, very ethical. And we're going to talk about everything. We're going to have a meeting. Why? So we can figure out what meeting we're going to do next. And this is a thing that continues over and over and over. So as fundraisers, we bring in the world, but then it hits a collaborative culture. So this is the thing that we have to do, is that we have to bring in something very, very different. The thing that unites, and we talked about here, how we get our cultures together. Little small, small wins over and over and over. What is the thing that we can bring in that no one else can bring in? We can bring in the language of people, the language of humanity. And this is the thing, this is our challenge here today. And this is, this is what we're going to be doing for the rest of our careers. Can we change the language that's inclusive rather than another silo? That's the challenge for all fundraising. <clears throat> because this is what we're actually looking for. The people that we're turning into, the people is more universalism. The bottom line is inspiration. This is not an option. We can't go, oh, well, ROI says we need to do this. No, it has to be inspired. And so this is what I'm going to bring Alan on. Alan, where are you? OK, <laughs> it's your turn. And we're going to talk about what inspiration actually means, because it's a bottom line. It's not an option. Thank you. Well, I'm part. Thank you very much, Pat. Ladies and gentlemen, that was bizarre to see Pat Dade talking for 10 minutes. Um, I was fortunate enough to do the two full day master class with Pat once on the 108 different reasons people tick and, and why we do things. It was absolutely inspiring, but I've needed 20 grams of Valium to sleep every night since. Um, it's absolutely mind boggling. 
The reason for involving Pat and for a lot of work we've done with him over the years is looking at what culture is it that drives massive growths in charities, NGOs, and nonprofits. And we started asking this question um, as I grew up out of being one of Thatcher's children. So I sort of started volunteer fundraising in the late 80s, I then became a professional and built my career through the 90s and, and the noughties. And there was a whole period of time when people were saying, we need to behave more like corporates. I heard this from every direction when I was in-house working as a head of fundraising and then from many, many of my clients. And that became the mantra, we need to be more ruthless. We need to be more ROI focused. We need to measure everything. Our job is to screw every last penny we can possibly get out of our donors. And this grated on me. And it grated on me, and it grated on me. Working with the guys from Plymouth, working with over 300 clients in the last three years, and critically looking at the fact, the data, with Pat. I can now unequivocally say that is the best way to grow charities, NGOs, and nonprofits to adopt what is called the best of commercial practice. The unequivocal answer to that is no. If it were so, why are the commercial sector trying to become more like the charity, NGO, and nonprofit sector? Now, I'm not saying for a minute we don't have to be absolutely professional. We have to be absolutely the best at everything we do. And of course, the job of us is to make big profits. <coughs> very, very big ones. The answer, the bit in the middle, the only way to bring together that conflict of power v universalism is the acceptance of this sector, which is the profit with purpose sector. Everyone in this room, there are many trustees, there are many chief executives, many, many professional fundraisers, and a few very enthusiastic amateurs who are probably the best of the lot, actually. Um, all of us have one thing in common, is our job is to apply the maximum resource to achieving our mission. And in the modern world, that means people, time, and money. Yep, yeah? do we agree with that? So our job is to make as much profit as we can but what makes us differ from other sectors is how we choose to spend it. We don't give it out in quarterly bonus cycles. We spend it on something that, in our opinion, is going to make the world a slightly better place. Now, here's a problem. There isn't a legal framework within which the profit for purpose people, which is us, <coughs> our subset of the of another sector exists. At the moment, there's three types of sector. There's the public sector. We know what that's there for. There's the for-profit sector, and it's only measured on how much money it makes. And then there's the non-profit sector, which is only measured on how little it spends or risks. <coughs> There is no legal construct for people who raise huge amounts of money to do a good thing. <coughs> people like us. So we take ourselves as a subculture of the nonprofit sector and we do exactly what Pat <coughs> says. Is we go out into a fast moving world and fundraisers need to move fast, 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 because that's the world that we are in. And we get excited, we move fast. We get excited, we move fast. We get more excited, we move fast. And then we go back to the office full of inspiration, full of excitement, and everything goes clung. Hands up anybody in the room who's had that experience. Okay. So we're looking at the cultures that cut through that and drive relentless growth. Would you consider today value for money if I can boil that down to two words for you? Oh, yeah? yeah? Well, who said, oh, yeah? <laughs> Someone's suffering really badly out there. Oh, that's Belgium. It took you two and a half years to get a government, if I remember correctly. <laughs> okay. Wow, that's going to take a while. Okay, so profit with purpose. Let's understand profit with purpose. We've heard a lot of talk about Unilever today up on the, 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 the biggest global fa face that there is. And when the chief executive said, we are the world's biggest NGO, he's right. 
Unilever is the world's biggest non-governmental organization. But that's way out of the league for most of us. So I thought, how can I bring this idea of profit with purpose down to a minuscule level? So I started researching, I started looking at things, and then I had one of those wake up early in the morning, oh, why am I so stupid moments. Yeah? I'm lucky enough to run a very small business up in the highlands of Scotland. I can see a few faces in the room who've, who've been there. Please don't give away any of the secrets to everybody else. Um, but that business has numerous purposes. One of them is to hopefully one day make a profit and get me through squeaky bum time. Uh, second is uh, um, for the development of the staff so that they can move on and work in bigger and better businesses of the, of the same type. But it has another purpose, and it's them. It's a really cute red squirrel. And I thought I would just tell you a story of how someone didn't understand purpose and profit with purpose. And I gave a talk similar to this to the American Association of Fundraising Professionals. It was a tough gig. It was in Puerto Rico. Life, life sucks. Um, and I got talking about profit with purpose and how that really works and that really, really drives people, and particularly fundraisers, because we like moving fast and we like hitting targets, but we've got to have a reason to keep going especially when the rest of the organization wants to discuss our Pantone color for 17 and a half hours before letting us move to the next stage of, of proofing. And I was explaining one of the purposes of the business in Scotland is to protect the red squirrels. And this major donor fundraiser was actually from Canada, I'll let the Americans off the hook. Um, he, he was saying, well, how do you make money out of that? And I went, we don't. We've got a red squirrel colony out the back of the hotel. and One of the purposes of the business is to protect them. I said, do you charge people tickets to go and see them? And I thought, if we did that, people would know where they are, <laughs> and then they wouldn't be protected anymore. And he went, oh, I don't get it. Went, brand, brand. It must be great for the brand to protect the, the, the red squirrels. And I went, no, no, because if we put it in our brand, then people will know where they are, and then they won't be protecting the bloody squirrels anymore. Well, you know, we hide them. That's the point. And he goes, I don't get it. How does your benefit? How does your business benefit? from protecting the squirrels. I said, the business benefits by protecting the squirrels. It's one of the purposes, you muppet. <laughs> Can you not get this? You know, there are benefits that are not financial. It makes me feel good to protect the squirrels. So we've got loads of purpose in the business. We've got a great kitchen. We've got an awesome bar. Yeah, we've got staff that do all this kind of stuff. We've got a profit target that one day hopefully we'll hit. It hasn't been done yet, and it keeps me awake at night. But out of all the different purpose of the businesses, which do you think is the one most favored by all our guests and all our staff? It's all about those bloody squirrels. <laughs> and before you think we're all cute and fluffy, ladies and gentlemen, what's one essential ingredient of protecting red squirrels? Shooting the gray ones, yeah. <laughs> okay, so maybe we can make some money doing that one day. But nobody gets to know where the red squirrels are. That's a real purpose in a business. And you believe me, having the red squirrels in the business makes the staff happier, prouder to be there, work harder, and is moving us towards profit quicker. It is actually all the same thing. So I'm now going to introduce you to the single most important word in fundraising. Yeah? 99% of the room can see it. I know there's at least two visually impaired people in the room, so I'm not going to ask you to guess. The world, the word, is why. Why, the question why, is what gives us purpose. The question how do we do something gives us meetings. You know, the question what shall we do gives us arguments. But the question why brings us all together and keeps us going, and all the great fundraising organizations that have doubled, tripled, quadrupled, or multiplied their income by even more than that have powerfully and simply answered the question, why? And this is why it's so important. There's two speech bubbles appearing on the screen. One of them says, your why. The other one says, the donor's why. In the middle, they intersect like a Venn diagram, and the bit in the middle is the fun stuff, and this is the world inhabited by every great fundraiser. And to refer to Louise, that therefore means everybody in the organization. This is the fun stuff. I've had a year full of whys, um, and I'm never going to be quite the same 
again, I've been privileged over the last year to 18 months to be present at some of the most stunning why moments when organizations have reconnected, not with what we do or how we do it, but the why. I can see two gentlemen from Cystic Fibrosis Trust here. The moment when a young lady, a young woman with cystic fibrosis reconnected the entire trust with a very brief phrase, which was, I'm jealous because I'll never reach my 50th birthday was one of the most powerful whys we've ever seen. I was working with a children's hospital out in Australia when they were going round and round and round in circles about all the different services that they had to communicate in their fundraising. The guy who founded the hospital was there. And I just said, you look like you're in your 70s. Why are you doing this? Why are you fundraising for a hospital that you should have long retired from? And he said, because there's always more I will do for a sick child. There can never be enough. There can never be a thought. The job will never be finished. This was always more I will do. Therefore, we can never have enough money. But the one I'm going to leave you with is actually the one that stuck with me most. And it was an organization that just referred back to its why for a second time. And it was a moment I'm going to take for me as the defining moment of 2014. And it was with AIDS Fonds Netherlands. AIDS Fonds Netherlands, three different brands, quite confused um, about a year ago. And they, they, their communications had all become around. People living with HIV AIDS, yeah, they've got human rights too. Yep, we need to represent their human rights. And by the way, can we have a few euros a month, please? And it wasn't being hugely successful. There was then a moment in a room, of, I don't know, I guess there must have been about 30 people there, Jacob, something like that. Uh, it was quite a powerful day. People talking stories, telling us what it's like. And then out broke from the conversation is, we've got to tell people the good news. I said, what's the good news? And they said, there's more people living with AIDS now than there ever have been. At which point my emotional Tourette's came out and said, how's that good news? And I said, but they're living longer and they're living better. Yet they've still got it. They've still got HIV AIDS. And I said, how many people are living with it? And they said, 38 million. I said, but there's all, all this 36 million people died of it. 38 million people got it. That means there's more people got HIV AIDS now than ever have. And they went, yeah. I said, so the problem, not really human rights. The big problem here, the why we have to keep going, and the why we need a lot more money, is nothing to do with human rights. That's subsidiary. We've got to beat that virus. More people have got the HIV virus than have ever died of it. So the purpose, the reason we need a lot more money is to beat that virus, at which point half the room who were HIV positive, unknown to me, leapt into life and said, that's absolutely right. I might look quite good. I can still go dancing, but I don't want to have AIDS. Yep. Everybody said it. Instant rebrand. That's the why. Beat the virus. Turns out there's only three ways you can beat the virus. One is live longer with it. Two is stop it spreading. And three is kill it. There you go. Bob's your uncle. Which one of those three things do you want to give money to? You've got your why and your what. All you need then is the how, which is sign up to a monthly direct debit. There's fundraising in a nutshell. Okay. <laughs> it is that simple. Ah, how many people? Well, let's see how many people. Simple is everything, but there's a word that's often confused with simple. What's that word? Thank you very much, friends. friends. I, appreciate that. <laughs> okay. I love that bit. But that's not the why moment I'm referring to, and that's not the moment I'll remember forever. Because I realize that purpose, the why, is different. It's different to strategic objectives. It's different to big, hairy, audacious goals. They're targets. They're in the sand. They're fixed things we go for. Purpose is what keeps us going no matter what. Purpose is the irrational, emotional, sometimes even impossible thing that gets us out of bed in our morning. Phil Barden said it in the first seminar of this morning. The 40-bit conscious processor won't get out of bed in the morning. It's the inner chimpanzee that does that. Purpose is emotional, and it keeps us going. You may not know, but there was a why. There was a campaign being created by AIDS Fonds Netherland, which is the spiritual home of the HIV AIDS movement. And they were on their way to the World's AIDS Conference in Melbourne when a significant part of their senior team all went down on MH17 in the Ukraine. Some of you will remember the incredibly touching footage of the, the silent funeral through the canals of Amsterdam when half a million people turned out to pay tribute to these researchers. The moment I remember 
is going back into an organization recovering from that tragedy, not knowing what to expect yet, and just walking into a room of quiet people and the chief executive just nodding and saying, it's still on, we're still going to beat that virus. That's what I'll take with me from this year. I promise to boil it down to two words for you. We already have the best purposes. We absolutely do. They're already there. Finding them and sticking to that purpose is the single thing that drives culture that makes great fundraising important. There's two words on the screen now. The word at the top is why. The word at the bottom is how. That word how, spend less time talking about that. And that word why, spend more time talking about that. Focus on the why, and that's what makes our sector different. And that's the thing, single thing that drives the culture that is so essential to massive fundraising growth.